The Labyrinth, a novel based on the Jim Henson film by A.C.H. Smith, read by Rose in the Library. Chapter 5, Bad Memories, Part 1. As she screamed, dropping backward down the shaft, Sarah realized that her fall was being slightly impeded by things brushing against her. Large, thick leaves they might be, or some sort of tough fungus sprouting from the walls of this pit. Whatever they were, she tried to grab hold of one to save herself from the terrible smash she expected every instant. She was falling too fast. Then, by blind chance, her wrist landed smack in one of the things, which at once closed firmly. With a jolt that almost disjointed her, she found herself dangling by one arm. Oh! she gasped in relief, and felt herself heaving for breath. She looked down the shaft to see how close she had been to breaking every bone. All she could see was a long tunnel lined with the things that had broken her fall. She looked up. The doorway through which she had entered the shaft was very high above her. As her eyes adjusted to the gloomy light, she saw what it was that had caught hold of her. A hand. All around her, protruding from the sides of the shaft, Hands were groping in the air like reeds under water. Her relief gave way to a sick feeling. She was in the grip of a hand with no arm or body attached to it, and she had no apparent means of ever releasing herself. Perhaps they were carnivorous hands, or like those spiders that simply dissolved you away over long periods of time. She looked nervously, up and down the shaft again, this time to see if there were any skeletons dangling there, as in a jungle trap. She saw none. And now she felt other hands reaching for her and fighting her, taking hold of her by the legs and the body. There were hands on her thighs, her ankles, her neck. She shuddered and shouted, Stop that! Knowing it was futile, she called, Help! Help! She writhed, trying to shake them all off, and with her free hand reached out for a hold in a despairing attempt to climb away. All she could see to grasp hold of was yet another hand. Hesitantly, she put hers in it, and it responded immediately, grasping her hand firmly. With the idea of perhaps climbing up the hand as though on a ladder, she tried to free her wrist from the first hand. It was no good. Now she was more tightly held than ever, stuck in a web of hands. Help! she whimpered. She felt a tap on her shoulder and turned her head to see what it was. To her bewilderment, she saw that hands to one side of her contrived to form themselves into a face of sorts, with finger and thumb circles for eyes and two hands working together to fashion a mouth. And the mouth spoke to her. What do you mean, help? it said. We are helping. We're the helping hands. You're hurting, Sarah told them. It was not quite true. Fear, rather than pain, was what afflicted her. Now there were several more faces of hands around her. Would you like us to let go? One of them asked. Sarah glanced down the shaft. Ah, uh, no. Well then, one of the mouths said, come on, which way? Which way? She asked, nonplussed. Up or down? Oh, she was more confused. Ah. Uh, she looked back up the shaft toward the light 
but that would be a kind of retreat. She looked down into the unknown, unfathomable abyss. Come on, come on, an impatient voice urged her. We haven't got all day. Haven't you? Sarah thought to herself. It's a big decision for a, said a sympathetic voice. Which way do you want to go? Asked an insistent one. Everyone in the labyrinth was so peremptory. I've got good reason to be in a hurry, Sarah felt. I've only got thirteen hours to find my baby brother, and heaven knows how much time has already gone by. But why are all these people, if you can call them people, so bossy? Come on, come on. Well, uh, Sarah still hesitated. Up was chicken, and down was dreadful. Many faces were watching her indecisiveness. Several of them were snickering, covering their mouths with another hand. She took a deep breath. Well, since that's the way I'm pointed, I'll go on down. She chose down? She heard the snickers behind their hands. She chose down. Was that wrong? Sarah inquired timidly. Too late now, said one of the hand faces. And with that, they started to hand her down the shaft, not roughly. She heard them singing something like a shanty. Down, 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 hand a down, boys. We'll all go to town, boys. Down, 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 hand a down, boys. Never a frown, boys. Down, down, down. And down she went, far down, until she found herself held momentarily above a manhole while the helping hands removed the cover of it. Then the lowest hands let go of her, dropping her neatly down in, into the manhole, and the last she saw of the hands was there waving goodbye, helpfully. As she landed on the stone floor of a dark, small cell, the cover was replaced on the manhole with a clunk. In pitch darkness, Sarah sat down. Her face was blank. The picture of her silent face was clearly beamed to a crystal in the chamber of the Goblin King. She's in the oubliette, Jareth observed. The goblins cackled w wickedly, dancing and prancing around. Their jaws gaped with merriment, and they slapped their thighs. Shut up, Jareth told them. They froze. Their heads twitched around to look at their king. A sly goblin inquired, Wrong, lass. She shouldn't have gotten as far as the oubliette. Jareth was still staring at the picture of Sarah's face in the crystal. He shook his head. She should have given up by now. She'll never give up, said a keen goblin. Ha! Jareth laughed mirthlessly. Won't she? She'll give up soon enough when she has to start all over. It pleased him to think of his labyrinth as a board game. If you got too close to the winning square, you might find a snake taking you back to the start. No one had, and very few had gotten as far as this disturbing girl who was too old to be turned into a goblin. Jareth examined her face in his crystal. Too old to be a goblin, but too young to be kept by him. Damn her innocent eyes. She had to be sent back to square one immediately, before she became a serious threat to Toby. And he knew the snake for the job. Hoggle, he called, spinning the crystal. Hoggle's face appeared in it. She's in the oubliette, Jareth said. Get her back to the outer walls. Hoggle cocked his head, grimacing. She's quite determined, your majesty. It won't be an easy... Do it. Jareth flipped the crystal into the air, 
where it vanished like a bubble. He chuckled, imagining Sarah's face when she found herself beside Hoggle's pond again. Then he threw back his head and roared. The goblins watched him uncertainly. Was it all right to laugh now? Well, go ahead, Jareth told them. With the simple glee that is natural to evil-hearted folk, the goblins launched themselves into their full routine of cackles and snickers. The keen goblin directed them like a conductor, bringing them up to a crescendo of malign mirth.